Hi everyone, uh, welcome to Watts 1010 Introduction to Web Development Advanced Markup Assignment, which is a little bit of a misnomer because this is as much about CSS as it is about HTML markup. So um, it is advanced markup because uh, we're doing just more things with HTML. Of course, first thing that we need to do, we're starting here on the SU Web Dev uh, source repository. We need to fork it. To our personal account. And now that we have our own personal copy of this, we need to clone it to our Code Anywhere development environment. So I'm going to copy the SSH clone URL and create a new dev box here in Code Anywhere. So I'm going to call this advanced markup. And the URL that I'm going to clone in is that one. I will create it. And it'll take it a little while to create the box and clone it out. So now that uh, our development box is completely set up, we will be able to start working through the assignment. Uh, I'm going to click back over here to the repo so that I can read through the, the requirements with you. It says we need to pay attention to the to-dos. So in a lot of these uh, HTML files, there are to-dos. And that's a way of notating what you need to do remaining in a file. Uh, often you won't be able to complete whatever it is you're working on, or you might uh, be working on something and notice uh, something that could be improved or changed somewhere else. You leave a to-do in the file, and whoever picks up that, that file next can see those to-dos, hopefully address them the next time they come through, Hopefully you can come back through and uh, take care of them so that you can remove them. It's really important to remove to-dos after you've actually done the work so that you don't create any misnomers. A lot of tools will identify the presence of to-dos in files so uh, and highlight them or alert you to them somehow. So once you've uh, opened up the HTML files, you'll notice that there are those to-dos. Uh, we need to work through this list of requirements uh, in ways that we need to modify these HTML files. Uh, if you load up index.html sort of right away, then you will notice that then you will notice that it has a lot of content to it already. So again, the best way to load this up in order to work with it is to uh, open to browse the file or run the project <laughs> and then we'll copy that URL that it gives us there and I'm going to open that in a new tab because I prefer to switch between tabs so I'm just going to set my two tabs up right here so that I can flip flop between them um, so this is what it looks like when we first start out and as you can see there's no links in here uh, so if I whatever I click, it's just going to keep showing me the same thing because it's not actually linking anywhere. So it's just going to take me back to this page. Um, I can see the poem laying out. It's a sonnet. Uh, I see a share this area. A did you know aside and a footer with navigation in it, a header with navigation. So I see all the parts that I expect to see, and that certainly does correspond to what I see here in index.html. So that is, that's good. Uh, looking through this, I see some of these to-dos. I see to-do, add proper hrefs to links. Uh, make this list be a horizontal navigation. Make the sidebar float right. Uh, remove bullets and style the poem. And 
again add proper hrefs here. And see that the hrefs here are all empty. So these href attributes on the anchor tag are what tells uh, your link where to link to. And so they have nothing in there, so that's why they're not linking anywhere. And it keeps taking us back somewhere. I see there's a, a copyright statement. I should probably change this. Um, and otherwise, it looks like that's sort of all that we have on that one. There are a couple of other HTML files. So I also have this about po file. And there are to-dos all throughout this. Again, linking all the pages. It says use a definition list to format this information. Um, fill in formatting markup as needed. So looking through all of this, if there's any way that I can make it better with some better markup, then uh, I could do that. Um, and create an accessible table structure representing the provided table of information in postselectedworks.pdf. Well, that's interesting. If I look here, I can't actually view that. Um, that doesn't look right. So, uh, However, if you do open up that PDF on its own uh, from the repository, then you'll see something like this. So okay, this is a, a table of pose selected works. And I could work from this, which is a table that's fairly clean. It's got some issues. I could select and copy and paste, though. Or I notice that in the repository, there's also this CSV file, which contains the same information but formatted as an escaped CSV. And by escaped, I mean these are the names of short stories and poems, so they should have quotes around them, but quotes are special inside of CSVs because they tell the file that there's something in there that needs to be exact. There's also a little bit of bad data with these weird things here. And this is pretty typical of the kind of stuff that you'll get you know, as you try to work through things. Um, you're always going to have to do a little bit of data cleanup as, as you're building through things. And so knowing your tools and having a good set of tools can really help you work through stuff uh, pretty quickly. This doesn't seem too bad, so we'll come back to this in a second. Um, but for now, uh, let's go ahead and dive into some of these uh, big things that we're going to have to do. Um, so again, returning to the requirements list, uh, put in the hrefs. Um, we need to uh, style navigational lists. Um, we need to uh, add internal links to the in-text citations. That that's that's an interesting uh, thing to do, and. Um, we need to use uh, the super tag around the in-text citations. All right, all this stuff seems like it was mentioned in those to-dos. Uh, the only other thing is that I'll note that we also were talking about you know thinking about the ways that we name things. So as we work through things and we're adding um, elements here, let's keep in mind as we add classes and all that we need to be trying to name things in ways that make sense. So. Um, so that'll be good. Um, let's see. Uh, we're going to go back into this file and just start working on stuff. So this home href, it might be tempting to just put like um, a slash or something there. But the problem is that that's actually going to take us back to the root of the server, not just the root of the website. So in some situations, that's going to be the root of the website. But in other situations, if your website's deployed to a subdirectory, um, that's not going to be your website. That's going to be, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the the root of a server that has many websites on it. So for example, on GitHub pages, when your page is deployed, it lives in a subdirectory. And so if you link to just the forward slash, 
then you're linking to the root of that server, which would just be, you know, your username.github.io. And uh, that that wouldn't actually be the website. The, your, your website is, you know, username.github.io slash website subdirectory. So, uh, so what you would need to do is, um, and the, alternatively, on Code Anywhere, when you view your website, notice that here, it, it doesn't have any subdirectory. There's no subdirectory here. So over here, when I, when I make my final GitHub web page, I'm gonna, it's going to live at shonr.github.io slash watts1010-adv-markup. And right now, nothing lives there because I haven't deployed it. However, on Code Anywhere, it lives, it doesn't have that subdirectory off of the URL. So the, the forward slash would work at Code Anywhere, but it wouldn't work on GitHub pages. So the solution is to just use a relative link to the index.html file, which is this file itself. So for this, fi for this file, it doesn't matter too much, but in the other files, we'll need to link directly to the index.html file. And likewise, we'll need to link uh, directly to um, some of these other files as well, like about Poe and interpretation. So now that we've linked to these files, if we save this, the links on our homepage here, if we refresh, these links, notice how they lit up blue again because now they point somewhere that we've never been. And so now I can see down in the bottom of my window when I hover over these, and then if I click them, I can see that we are going to the different pages. So there's the interpretation page, and there's the about Poe page. So we can see that those links are now working. So it would be really tempting maybe to just copy and paste this, and I mean, we certainly can do that. But I also recommend just typing it in again to Make sure that you realize what you're doing. So we're linking to index.html directly, and we're using a relative link because we're not preceding it with an HTTP anything or with a slash anything. So it's it's a relative link. Um, remember, absolute links start with either HTTP or a slash, and so uh, we're not using that. Um, and link that to about po, and link this to interpretation. We'll save there, click back over here, refresh, scroll down, and looks like these footer links on the home page are working too. But notice how when I actually click into interpretation, if I click about Poe, I don't get taken anywhere because these links are still empty, so it just is linking back to itself. So I need to edit all the rest of the pages too. So I'm gonna click into about Poe I'm going to edit. I'm starting down here at the footer of the page. Now I'm going to fill in these links on all of the pages so that I can click through the site at will. And I think that's the first most important thing to do. Uh, because then your testing and everything becomes a lot easier. Because don't forget that you're going to write styles that are going to affect all of the pages on your site because your site is only linking to one style sheet all right and then now I need to do the interpretation page so I'm just going to start up here type in index.html about po.html and Now notice that on each page, um, a different one of these links has this class of active. That's set up so that as you click through the pages, when you write your styles, you could target this class active and you could style whichever link has the active class differently. And then as users click through the pages, they'll be it'll highlight what page they're on. We'll, we'll take a look at how to do that as we work on some styles for this navigation. Okay, 
So now we've got a completely linked website. And if we refresh this page, we should be able to click around. There's about po, we can go home. Well, it looks like our about po page is missing a link in the header. So click back to about po. There we go. Just need to refresh. Definitely be sure that you refresh. <laughs> Especially when working with static pages, it can um, sometimes browsers can hold on as you're testing. But this is looking good. So we can click through these and we see them changing pretty quickly. Uh, the Coding Anywhere development server seems decently speedy. So let's go ahead and move on to uh, sort of the next thing. So in our index.html and in everywhere else, we have we have definitely added proper hrefs so we can delete those to-dos. So as we see these to-dos that we've accomplished, we'll get rid of them. That feels good. Uh, now it says we need to make this list be a horizontal navigation. Um, so to do that, we're going to have to edit the styles. And I will open up the styles right here. So here's the styles for the advanced markup assignment, and it's just empty. So um, the first thing that we're styling, I guess, is to make this list, which is the top nav list within nav, to make this list go horizontal. Now, if we want to make all of the lists go horizontal, which I think we do, we do want to make this list go horizontal too. That's bottom nav. I think we should probably just target the lists that are inside nav elements since that seems like what we want to do overall. So we're going to target the lists that are inside nav elements to make those go horizontal. And in order to write that, we're going to select first the nav element and then we're going to put a space and that indicates that inside of any nav element, I want you to find these list elements and now that we've got these list elements, we want you to give us the list items. So we are targeting all the list items that are inside of a list, an unordered list that is inside of a nav element. And we're going to set the display of those to inline. Now by default, if you'll notice, List items are displayed as block level elements. So are headings and so are paragraphs. And what that means is that block level elements line up vertically on the page by default. So list items are block level elements, which means that they line up vertically on the page by default. Now, the headings and paragraphs also line up vertically on the page. Other elements like images or links or bold tags or italics tags, those line up horizontally on the page and those are called inline elements. And that's why those can go inside of paragraphs so that you have a link inside the paragraph and it just lines up with all the rest of the text inside the paragraph. So what we wanna do is change the setting for these list items from block to inline, and the setting that we're gonna change is the display setting. So we're gonna do that with CSS. We're going to configure it so that these list items use the inline display type. And that's all that we're going to do. So when I save that, and I refresh, <laughs> there's no change. So now that I've refreshed a half dozen times or something and uh, used held down the shift button and clicked refresh to do a hard refresh, I uh, have gotten it to um, update that style sheet so that we can see that now these navigational elements are lining up horizontally. And I can also see in my inspector here which I can get to if I just right click and then hit inspect element, then I can see that if I click on this LI element, 
that this nav ULLI display inline style is applying here. And what I can see is that if I uncheck this box, it goes back to the old block display because it goes back to the next level of cascading that would influence his style. Um, so here I'm using the display inline and I'm making them lay out horizontally. So that's one key element to understanding general page layout uh, in CSS is uh, the difference between block and inline level elements and the way that those uh, are, uh, are different when they display. If we scroll down to the bottom, we'll also notice that this is applied to the footer as well. And if I click into these other pages, you'll notice that this is also applying to all of the other pages because they are structured in the same way. So the same style is able to apply. And this is the benefit of external style sheets. I write the style once and it's going to apply in all these different situations. Now that can be difficult sometimes, but it can also be uh, really nice. So it uh, just sort of depends. Um, you want to be careful about, you know, obviously making your styles and everything, but in general, this is a, this is a real benefit. So if I go back to code anywhere, I can go back to the index.html and so make this list horizontal navigation that is done. The next thing I want to do is add a style to make these active links highlight better. That'll be uh, make it a lot more uh, clear to navigate between the pages. So in order to do that, I'm going to go into the style sheet and I'm just going to say any link that has the active class. So that is just a dot active. And what that is saying is any link with the class active, the dot indicates a class. I want the font weight to be bold. And that's going to make any class with a dot active um, is font weight bold. And it's telling me that I don't even need to be that specific. I could get away with just using dot active. And that's true. I could just define that the class dot active means that your font weight is bold. But I might want to define other uh, things that change when something's active. So um, I'm going to leave it like that for the moment. When I go over here, if I refresh, you'll notice that I have now the home page is bold. If I click about po, the about po page becomes bold. And if I click interpretation, then the interpretation page is bold. And that's because these elements have that active class. And I can verify that by inspecting. And I can see here that the interpretation element on this page has the active class. But if I click to about po and I inspect that element, then now that one has the active class and the other one doesn't. So again, using your inspector is very handy to see what's going on here uh, as you're moving around and working on projects. So now that we've done that, we can go back to the index.html file and we can look and we can see that the next thing to do that we need to do is to make our sidebar float right. There's kind of a lot of, a couple of different ways that we can make the sidebar go to the right. And uh, I thought that I would illustrate a couple of them and mostly I'm gonna leave it to you to read and think about uh, how you want to handle it. And we'll, we'll continue having discussions and being able to talk about um, what all is you need to consider when you're thinking about how to handle page layout. Um, but for now, we're gonna make these sidebars uh, float to the right. And so they are the asides with the ID sidebar, but they're the only aside tags that we have. So I'm gonna go into styles.css, and the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, well, the thing with the ID sidebar, which is this aside, I want the width to be controlled first. So I'm just gonna set its width, and I'm just gonna pick an arbitrary amount. I'm just gonna say, um, the width should be 250 pixels. And then I'm going to set what's called a float on it. And the float, I'm going to have it float to the right. And that is actually going to move that sidebar over to the right. So in order to make it more clear, I'm also going to put a background color on it. 
and I'm just going to make it pink so that we can see where it shows up. So now that that has been updated, I'm going to go over here. I'm going to click the home link and you notice now I see my sidebar floating to the right and it's pink. And that's pretty great. Um, that's going to, you know, work out fairly well. Uh, we can enhance that in a lot of ways. Um, some ways that you should probably consider enhancing it. Um, we can set margins around it. So we could set like a 20 pixel margin around it and we could put padding in and we could put like say a 10 pixel padding. And if we saved, remember padding is the space inside the box and margin is the space outside the box. So if we do that, we should have a little more space for this text and a little more space over here um, around the edge. So when we refresh, and in fact, we have that. So a little more space for the text looks a little more comfortable and a little more space around the edge looks a little more comfortable there too. Now this is probably not exactly how we want things to look. And that's all part of the joy of, uh, that's all part of the joy of, of working with HTML is that you get to, you get to try things out and move things around and everything all over the place. So that's one way to get this to float to the right. There could be another way. Um, we could say uh, position absolute and we could put, we could then set um, positioning values. And in this case, we might set top at uh, say 10 px and right at say 30 px and this will have a completely different uh, effect so if we refresh uh, we now have things all all sort of off kilter there we forgot to add back in our width and background color. So it's, it's handy to use, you know, background colors and just set width so that you can see what's going on. And now you notice that you see how this shows up. And since we've limited the width, it's now being positioned 10 pixels from the top and however many pixels from the right. And again, we have it sized. And so we could use padding and margin here as well. And the difference is that this is absolute positioned. So it's always going to stay there and move even as we move around different windows um, and resize the window. So, um, so those are two different ways to achieve that goal. Um, through absolute positioning and through floating. Now, typically floating is what's going to be used the most. And so it's, it's uh, important probably to, uh, to attempt to make this work with the float. Um, but that's definitely uh, something that can be done. I want to uh, skip, I don't want to work through every single thing um, that this asks you to do uh, because I think, for example, um, you guys can already remove the bullets and style the poem uh, and there's a lot of a lot of catching things and, and touching things up um, and so forth. Uh, I really want to uh, show you just a little bit about how to handle this uh, accessible table because I think that's that's one of the key things. So if you look at um, again, if you look at this uh, if you look at this table here or at this data that we have here, you can see that it's year format and title. That's the data that we're trying to present. We can change things around however we want to. Um, and so actually, I think that it would be... Uh, very, very helpful to um, actually present these in, in the format of title, year, and format, or even title, format, and year. Um, and then the title could be a row um, heading and the, the, 
the year format and title can be column uh, headings. And so by by defining these things, we can make it so that screen readers and so forth can actually manage the data and allow people who are using screen readers to um, sort of sort and uh, filter data and be able to uh, access the data within the table uh, much more easily. And we do have a couple of um, ugly pieces of data, which we should probably take care of. And I'm just going to take care of just by cleaning them up here. And um, I'm also going to uh, go through and I'm going to copy all of this data. Now that I sort of cleaned up all of this stuff, I'm going to copy all of this data, go into about po, and then I'm just going to paste it all in. And I'm going to uh, select it and tab it over. And out of this uh, out of this selection, I'm going to um, I'm going to hold down the option key and use my um, three finger select to uh, create selections with individual cursors. And then um, once I have all of those individual cursors, I can go over here and I can kind of uh, work with with things. Um, so one thing that I can do is I can go, I can use the option and arrow to move um, a cursor between individual words. So again, this is just using um, text cursors on my operating system. So I'm just using um, option and arrow and I'm going to go over one and you notice that that took me right to in front of where that comma is on everything. And so I actually want to go one more space over. So I'm just going to hit the right arrow key once. And then now um, I'm going to use command and shift and press the right arrow key. And that's going to select everything from where the cursor was to the end of the line. And so I'm going to cut that information with command X and then I'm going to go back over to the first to the uh, I'm going to go back over to the beginning of the line and I'm just going to paste that information back in now that looks a little bit ugly but what I just did there was I just reversed the way that um, all of that information looks so now I can actually reselect this and tab it over so that it all starts nicely where I expect um, I want to get rid of these triple quotes, so I'm going to use the replace, and I'm going to say find triple quote and replace it with just one quote, and I'm going to click the replace all button there, and you see that it's underlining everywhere where it's going to replace, so that's great, replace all there. Uh, I notice that the balloon hoax down here has an extra quote there. And then um, I'm going to start filling in uh, this table. So I have table there. And in order to fill this in, I'm, gonna, I'm going to look at the accessibility guidelines that we link to in our resources in the module. So I'm looking at these web aim guidelines. So I'm going to put a caption um, for this table. And then I'm going to be using table headers with these scope attributes. So um, doing this style. And um, we'll also be putting on row scope attributes now that we rearranged uh, how that text is. So, so the first thing that I'm going to do is put in the caption tag and the caption is going to have contain information that summarizes the table. Uh, so this is going to be Edgar Allan Poe's, um, or I should say selected works, selected stories, poems, and uh, works by Edgar Allan Poe. That, that sounds like a decent summary to me. So I'm going to close that tag. The next thing that I need to do is put in a table row, which is the TR tag. And in this row, I'm going to have a bunch of headers. So I'm going to make TH and the scope of this header is going to be a column. 
and that's going to be the title. Oh. <laughs> I type title instead of th. Okay. So then uh, I'm going to do that again for year. I don't need this comma anymore, so I'm going to get rid of that. And I'm going to do the same thing for format. So it turns out that table head and table footer, the T head and T foot uh, tags are not, not really necessary for accessibility purposes. Those are more for printing purposes. And so they're only really useful if you have a very long table um, where you need to make sure that the header and footer repeat on multiple pages of printouts. Um, same goes for the table body. You really only need the table body if you've got a, a, a table head and a table footer defined. Um, the table body is really only for styling purposes. It doesn't hurt accessibility to use T head, T foot, and T body. Um, those are perfectly fine to use, and if they help you for styling, then that's great. Uh, or if they help you for JavaScript or anything else, that's great. Um, but in general, you don't need to use those as you uh, as you work through. Uh, your assignment. Um, however, you do need to use these scopes and you do need to use these TH, which stand for table header um, uh, tags. And, um, and so the TH tags are uh, special. Uh, the rest of the data will go in TD tags, which are table data, which defines a data cell in the table. So let's let's add another row for this first row of data that we have here for the black cat. And the black cat is actually a table header, but it's a row header. So um, the way to think about this is that if you um, if you were to refer to the data that is in the row, then you would expect it to be called by that data in the first column there, the title, right? Um, so if I was trying to talk about this story from 1845, I would call it the black cat. Um, that means that that's suitable for being the, the table header for this row. Now, if I were to talk about everything that is in the first column, those are all titles. And everything that's in the second column is going to be years. And everything that's in the third column is going to be the format. So here we have the title black cat in the first column, which also happens to be a header column. Then we have the, the year in the second column, and then the, the format, which is story, in the third column. And we're basically going to format all of the rest of these the same way. Here, I'll do one more um, just to reiterate that we're going to define the first column as a table header. And then we're going to define the other two columns as just data cells. And so what we're going to have when we're all done with this, and we can actually, we don't have to wait to totally finish to view it. I mean, we can try to view it here uh, in progress. And we should see something here is that we have a table that's being created here that has title, year, and format. And notice that these things are being automatically bolded because the default styling for table headers is to be centered and bolded. So that's why these are centered and bolded. Um, we can modify that styling um, all throughout. And uh, notice that all of these other works kind of pop out all crazy because they're not properly formatted yet. And it's just a bunch of text and um, the browser doesn't really know what to do with it at this point in time. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, move on to the next parts of this assignment. Um, basically, to create your accessible table, you'll just follow that pattern. And you will have created a table that then a screen reader can understand is a tabular presentation of data. Um, and uh, 
and it will understand what the headers are for the data and what columns are involved and rows are involved so that it can it can provide a good interface for uh, people who might be visually impaired or just for um, data systems that are trying to make sense of the data that you're presenting in a tabular format. Um, that could also be a search engine or another kind of system that was reading your page. So um, that's that's the other really critical aspect of this assignment. If we go back to the requirements list here, um, the rest of the assignment should be pretty uh, straightforward. Um, feel free to uh, keep poking around. You do not have to change any of the uh, HTML aside from what you're asked to write in uh, on your assignment page or, or in the to-dos but you are free to change it if you want to. So if you have an idea, if you want to try um, playing with some additional structures, or if you uh, want to try restructuring or renaming things in order to do more ambitious uh, styles, um, you're certainly free to do that. Uh, you'll, you'll also definitely want to uh, be controlling things like um, widths and heights. Uh, those are things that can help you create spacing on pages and juxtaposition. So um, you really need to, uh, you, you can really um, get a lot of uh, mileage out of that. Remember that you can resize things like resizing the images and floating them around. So the goal for this time is to create this uh, common structure that can be applied to all of your pages and that, um, and that gives all of your pages a uniform look and uh, lays them all out uh, in a way that, that works for this assignment. Um, for presenting this information about this poem, Sonnet Science, and, uh, and allows people to just kind of navigate around and learn about the poem, a little bit about Poe, and enjoy. So that's the challenge. Those are the basic pointers. And uh, I think it's pretty fun. Um, there's a lot of potential here. Feel free to bring in uh, whatever kinds of uh, design ideas, um, visual imagery or, or style ideas um, you want to um, keep exploring all of those uh, tutorials that we have linked uh, throughout for different uh, unique uh, CSS uh, techniques. If you have an idea, um, you know, how do I make a 3D looking box or how do I make um, text that has shadows or text that looks like it's glowing? Like um, if you Google for those, you'll find great tutorials and um, you can apply all of that to these assignments. Um, and so Keep going and uh, good luck and I look forward to seeing what you come up with. Bye.